What's up, guys? It's Chris from DMGH Podcast. Today we have with us Lane Kawaioka. He is a real estate investor, has more than 2,100 properties, and he's an engineer, and he actually is retiring today, and he is around 33 years old. So listen up. This is going to be a good one. Three, two, one. Let's go. Welcome to Don't Mind the Golden Handcuffs Podcast, or DMGH Podcast. A place for future and present attorneys or any young professional to find the motivation they need to further their minds, careers, and financial success. It's hard to make it out there when you came from nothing. We want to provide you with some help with that. Of course, a one-person team couldn't accomplish this. DMGH Podcast experienced guests will guide us on this road to career and financial success. First, let's take this law thing one step at a time with your host, Chris. Hey, Lane. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. My pleasure. I, uh, I'm i a fan of yours. I read your book. Uh, you're part of the book. Um, oh. The one thing that okay. changes everything that you yeah. sent to me through the mail. I didn't realize it'd be that quick. <laughs> it was very quick. I honestly, I expected it to take a lot longer than that. Yeah, all the way out from Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, Celine. So, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us what you do. Yeah, so today I'm 33 years old, but I, I started investing about 10 years ago, um, just right out of college. I think I, I'm a, kind of a lot like other you know professionals. Um, I'm an engineer today, so you know a lot of us are told to get a, go to school, get a good job, um, work at that job, and then um, you know buy a primary residence to. Uh, put yourself into debt all for the rest of your life, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I did that. I bought that house, but I was working on construction management jobs. So a lot of that's travel a lot. So it was never home. So I started to rent it out and became an accidental landlord. And thankfully, um, you know, just caught the bug. Um, that yeah. property was an A-class rental, probably what I shouldn't have bought, but it worked. Um, the rents were 2200 and the mortgage was 1600 and for a young 20 year old kid, that was a lot of beer money. And I was yeah. like, shoot, I got to do this again and again and again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so you also run um, a company, right? Do you want to share your website? Yeah. Um, so 2016, I got tired of um, answering the same questions from my buddies, you know, because I was buying, at the time, I was buying these turnkey rentals out of state. Um, mm-hmm. I lived in Seattle at the time, and then I was buying properties in like Birmingham, Atlanta, Indianapolis. Um, never really went and visited them. Just kind of used the internet and um, you know did my due diligence and hired inspectors from afar. So um, you know how it is. Like you know, you tell people about the stuff, but nobody goes out and does it. So yeah. what does a millennial do but make a podcast, <laughs> right, or yeah. a YouTube channel or a blog? So yeah. That's what I did. And, and so you know, like a lot of the the first twenty thirty podcasts are all about like turnkey rentals and remote investing. So a lot of those are very foundational, I think. But yeah. Um, yeah, I kept at it. And then, you know, three, three years later, here we are, um, doing bigger deals, apartments and mobile home parks and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. It's so funny because when I tell people that I've never physically visited the properties I do have, I always get this, uh, dumbfounded look like, wait a second, you have houses that you've never seen before. But like you said, if you do your due diligence and, uh, and the numbers work, you don't necessarily have to go to the property and see that as long as you hire the right people. That's right. That's right. There's a process to follow. And this is kind of where the, that engineering mindset comes. I mean, yeah. you just keep following it. There's going to be some uh, some issues that come up and, you know, some troubles. But, you know, for the most part, you're going to hit mostly, um, you know, good deals out there if you follow the process. Yeah, it's true. So why don't we get started? Um, so one concern that I um, usually have to address with attorneys and law students that work in big law is that although they have the income to invest in real estate, they see it as almost impossible to have a full-time job while investing. So one reason why I wanted to bring you on is that, as you as you stated earlier, you're also a, an engineer, right? So how do you advise people who want to invest in real estate but also have full-time and demanding jobs? Yeah, so I think um, most of the websites and podcasts out there, they kind of cater to like broke people, right? Yeah. Like those people are flipping houses, doing all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. That stuff is super active. And yeah, it's hard to juggle that with a full-time job. Um, but a lot of the guys I work with, like doctors, lawyers, engineers, 
I mean, you, you make such a high hourly rate at your job. It doesn't make sense to be like, yeah. you know, licking stamps on envelopes and wholesale and doing garbage like that. But yeah. as a passive investor, you know, you're picking up properties. You're not doing it like every day or even every quarter. You know, you might be doing one a year, or two a year at, at most. And it really shouldn't take you more than like a few hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, if it is, you're doing it completely wrong or you're just like, you know, what I see a lot of new investors doing is they just spend their time on the wrong things. Um, one, because they don't know what to do. And two, they're kind of slowing themselves down to do anything mm -hmm. so that they, you know, they kind of play it safe that way. Yeah. And what are some wrong moves that you see people do, especially young investors? Um, you know, maybe because I just have a lot of engineers follow me. Um, you know, they get like these like sheets of data of all like these markets and like, yeah, this is the trending unemployment. I'm like, dude, like, <laughs> you know, I'm an engineer, but I know just to throw that stuff out the window. It's more yeah. like relationships with people calling up brokers, you know, calling up building your passive investor network of other people like you and just asking around who are they using? You yeah. Know, where are they investing at? Um, I, I think maybe before we move any further, you know, like just if you're in a primary market and those are defined as, you know, places where the rent to value ratios don't make sense to um, invest. Yeah. Like Seattle, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Hawaii, places like that, cool places to live. You're not going to find cash flow in there. Mm -hmm. um, I try and stick to secondary and tertiary markets. So that next year down. So good examples of secondary markets that I like to invest in, like Birmingham, Atlanta, Indianapolis, Kansas City, Memphis, Little Rock, um, places like that, you know, that second tier city, kind of boring, but robust economies too. Um, so Detroit's a secondary con secondary market, but I'm not too sure about their economy. It's very one-sided with the automobile industry. Yeah. That's actually funny because I own some properties in Birmingham too. So we might be a rental real estate neighbors. <laughs> you never know. We probably are. <laughs> We're probably, I mean, a lot of us invest in that Newcastle area yeah, down there. Exactly. You know, just nor northeast, I think, of, of town. Yeah. So what's, um, what are some issues that you found when trying to invest while working full time? And how did you address those is issues? Um. Well, I think like people say, well, people are going to hear what I'm doing and they're going to fire me. And what I <laughs> what I say is like, dude, you're like a passive investor. Yeah. It, they can go ahead and fire you for being a passive investor, but you're a passive investor. You don't really do much, right? You have a property manager who's, you know, running the day to day. They might email you a few issues. Um, yeah, you're going to take some calls here and there. But like, it's no different than the other guy just taking their smoke break or sneaking, reading their book in their cubicle, you know, hours yeah. on the day, you know? Yeah. Um, again, I think it's just excuses, you know? I mean, if if you want to play it safe and not do anything, then we know what's going to happen, right? You're going to mm -hmm. be stuck at that day job for the next 40 years. Yeah, I was having dinner with an old friend and we we're talking about real estate investing. And as always, when you talk about it with someone, a light kind of turns on when they see the potential of real estate. Uh, and he said, but Chris, I, I wouldn't even know where to start looking. And I, I told him like some some golden rules that I've heard before, like the 1% rule and such. And I said, if you give me your cell phone right now, I can find a property in less than a minute. And he's like, there's no way. And I went on there and I, I, I found one in less than a minute. I found one in like 30 seconds. Of course, it's, you need to look more into it. But um, a lot of times you could tell if a property is going to make the cut or not by just looking at a few things. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it, it's and that's where like the mentor comes in, right? I think people have this ego where, oh, I can figure out myself, you know, just like going to the gym. Like, I, oh, you know, I, I don't need someone to spot me. You know, I know what to do yeah, or. Yeah. You know, I don't need someone to tell me how to talk to girls or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Like we have this ego where we don't want to pay another man money to tell us what to do. But yeah, I mean, yeah, you could probably figure it out. But how much time is it going to take to go listen to hundreds of podcasts and sift through all the garbage of forms? And yeah, I mean, some sometimes people value their time not as much as money for some reason. Yeah, that always struck me as or, as or other way around. Time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they value yeah, yeah their money more than their time. Uh, it's also I think few people always want their first deal to be some amazing deal where they could be financially free. But generally, your first deal isn't going to make you financially free, right? Right, right. I mean, you're when you're starting out, it's the hardest because people are just pitching softballs of 
you know, junk at you. Yeah. Um, just go out and get one. Um, hit some, hit a single. I'm always like, hit singles before you go after home runs. Yeah. And uh, I know, I know where that comes from. People just want security. They want a really good deal, so they know that if they can, they screw up a few times, which they will, they'll still make money. And just, that's just not how things are. You're gonna have to make, you have to screw up. And that's the beauty of having a mentor too, is that you avoid a lot of pitfalls. And a lot of times you don't know necessarily what your mentor is, is telling you to do. You don't know why he's telling you to do that. But then at, in time, you start realizing, oh, wow, he really saved me or she really saved me on that one when you look back. Right, exactly. But, you know, you shouldn't be paying a mentor like 20, oh, 30, course. 40 grand, yeah. especially if you only have $10,000. I mean, yeah, some of these mentorship groups are a little bit out yeah. there. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like the price that you spend for the – for the mentorship is literally the price of almost a house in cash right right i mean you're almost better off buying that house in cash and yeah growing it up right a little bit and learning from real life yeah i'm not seeing programs that go up i mean i'm sure you have seen even more expensive ones but ones that are like forty thousand fifty thousand sixty thousand like that's quite literally a house in cash in a lot of areas right right i mean i I think the the guys for some reason the guys who go to school they're, they're more skeptic yeah you know, people with money are more afraid of losing their money, and people who don't have money get caught up in all that that hype of hope, right? And they yeah. get sold on these programs. Yeah. Um. So I I know you most of your guys are like lawyers, and like you know, a lot of my guys are doctors and engineers, and I know how people like us think. Um, you know, a lot of times they want don't want to pay people to do it, but here's what I say: like, look, look how much money I spent on like I went to University of Washington. I mean, that's a lot of money for, you know, to get that degree. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're not going to spend five, 10 grand on like t- someone to guide you along your way. Yeah. And then also like, you got to think if you're that guy with like $30,000 in your bank account or a, just to say $100,000 in your bank account, not making anything, you know, you could buy three turnkey houses super easy and make, you know, $300 per property. So $900 yeah. a month, every month that you're losing in opportunity costs. Yeah, and I found that if you talk to them in a way where you show them the numbers, the light tends to tends to turn on. Uh, but there are a lot of skeptics out there. I think also because of um, all the new investment tools that are coming out, like you know, like the the cryptocurrency and such. Uh, but then I tell them like real estate rental properties have been here for forever, right? So right. it's it's right. not like some new thing that's being invented or or being thought up. Yeah, I'm not a I'm not a fan of that stuff. It's I don't I don't consider it investing. It's yeah. consider it trading. Yeah, if I don't understand the con- like what it is, I don't invest in it. And and a lot of new investment tools, even the people selling them and the people who invented it don't even fully understand. Right, right. I mean, the the reason why I like real estate is like kind of four four things. It you can cash flow, you can leverage it with these nice government subsidized loans, mm-hmm. and it's a hard tangible asset. Yeah, I guess those are three. But you know, those are the <laughs> three things that like. <laughs> Apply that to anything else, right? Like cryptocurrency yeah. is not a hard asset. It doesn't yeah. create cash flow. It's not leverageable. I mean, mm-hmm. yes, you could leverage it, but now you're playing with fire. Yeah. Uh, people do gold, right? Gold's a hard asset, but it's not, doesn't create income. Mm-hmm. And I find that also, like what I love about real estate specifically, and I'll probably get into this into a different video, but being able to use equity that you build. Like, like in your situation, right? You could buy, you could find a way to buy three houses in with your with the hundred thousand dollars, but if you also wanted to, there's other ways to go about it, right? You could buy one house in cash, then pull the equity in that house to buy another house. So there's so many ways to go about it, and you can't do that with stocks or crypto. You got to have that cash right now, and there's one way to buy it. Right, right, and then with 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 all the taxes, I mean, yeah. if, if on a bigger deal, you can do a cost seg, and you get a lot of it with bonus depreciation. You never have to pay taxes. Yeah, and it's funny because. Uh, with crypto, I, I read an article somewhere where it's like less than like 6% of people have paid taxes on, on the cryptocurrency they purchase. So the IRS yeah. is starting to decide like, <laughs> should we go for these people knowing that like half of them are like 16 year olds and 17 year olds? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just like these, like the house flippers, right? Like, yeah, you know, you, you put up on a screen like your good deal. We all know that you're, you're hiding the one out of five that you just yeah. totally bombed on. Exactly. But yeah, you made all this money, but you had to give the IRS half of it, right? Yeah. Whereas if you're a quiet passive investor, you're using your passive losses to just completely offset that gain. And hopefully, yeah. um, you know, you may even be able to bring that over to your W-2 side. 
mm-hmm. if uh, your spouse qualifies as a real estate professional or yeah i mean last year i made 100 grand at my day job so that's like the threshold where mm-hmm. you can bring $25,000 over from your passive losses yeah. and offset so i only paid like 15 grand of taxes yeah. that year yeah this year i um i operated at a loss even though i made money too which is the like one of the most beautiful parts of 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 real estate right 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 <laughs> Um, so why don't we get into the, the um the meat of it? Uh, so what is class A, B, and C assets, and what what factors should a person consider in deciding which to invest in, and why does it matter? Yeah, so class A, B, and C, and D are grades of property types and also neighborhoods. So sometimes they'll you, you'll they'll kind of combine the two, you know, a C class building and a C class area. But I like to talk in terms of you know neighborhood quality and building type so maybe we'll start with building type you know for the most part class a's are your new builds this is your 1990s and newer um 1990 to 1970 are b's um 1970 1960 is c um you know it, there's no hard and fast rule right mm-hmm. but like a, a you know you get your mentor and he can pick it out yeah well c plus yeah done right um, one general rule of thumb is a you know a broker tells you it's a B class building you already know it's a C. <laughs> you know, never listen to a bro- yeah. broker. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the other one is the uh, properly neighborhood um, classes, right? So yeah. A class are nice areas, white collar jobs, people making over eighty hundred grand a year there. Class B is your more blue collar, white collar mix. So. Um, I would, and I think with like Class C would be all blue collar, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of single mothers, that type. Um, here's the what I really how it comes down to um, my feeling when I go visit my properties or new deals, I go out and I just I, I drive out and I'm like, all right, Class A is like you know young female would probably like feel comfortable running around at nighttime, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, those yuck areas. Um, yeah. Class C, class B, it's like, well, maybe I might want to do some running at nighttime. I don't like running, but I don't <laughs> like, but like, you know, I wouldn't mind going for a stroll at nighttime. Yeah. Um, class, class C, I would say, mm, I don't even know if I want to even get out of the car. Yeah. I'm gonna get out of the car, but I'm gonna stay real close to it. Yeah. My runners done. <laughs> class D, it's like, all right, I'm gonna drive through at like no less than 15 yeah. miles per and check this property out. And don't even stop at red lights. Just kind of pass them if you can so you don't yeah. stop in one place for too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess that would be F class, but... <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. You, know, you got you to gotta play it cool, you know. You can't, you can't live life scared <laughs> yeah, too yeah. bad. That's true. But, so like, look, like the best places for cash flow are going to be in your D and C class, the lower end. Mm-hmm. That's where, where it scares off most... Um, so-called investors. Mm-hmm. Most so-called investors will go after the A-class stuff because they just want to own property. Yeah. And it's low hassle. So as mom and pa investors who want optimal returns, um, but we also want minimal headaches. So the sweet spot is sort of around a B and C class building. Yeah. Um, you know, like the A class is more for institutional investors that want to just do capital preservation. They just want to hold on to their money and make two to three percent a year. Mm-hmm. But if you're looking for those returns in the teens, like mom and pa investors want, you're going to have to get your hands a little dirty and get to the C and B class. Okay. And the higher the class in terms of A and B and C, uh, are the properties more expensive? Oh, yeah. 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 And, and you're not going to get the higher rent-to-value ratios. Yeah. So in like, let's just say D class, you might get like a 1.5 to 2% rent to value ratio. C class, you might be getting like a 1.0 to 1.5 or low, low 1%. Mm -hmm. Um, B class, you might be around 1% or a little less. But as you can see, as you go to the A class, now you're, you're starting to get like half a percent rent to value ratios across the board. Um, Obviously it depends on which market. Because that can also impact mm-hmm. things, but it's not a linear thing. It's a more of like it's a curve. Mm-hmm. So as the property price goes up, your rents dramatically goes down in proportion. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is that similar to the one percent rule, or is that a different 
like do you use that instead of the one percent rule i use the one percent rule like just super like in like 10 seconds just looking okay. at something yeah you know so um, i like deals at cash flow so like i i don't even look at stuff in like primary markets yeah exactly you know? yeah i get that a lot i get messages um people will will message me, ask me to look at a property in New Jersey, New York. And I go, look, I, I'm not even going to entertain the thought of investing in New York or New Jersey. I mean, I'm sure there's some properties somewhere in, in New Jersey, New York that you could do that with, but majority of them, it's almost impossible. The properties are four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 when the rent is like at most uh, 2000 2300 Right, right. And not, not to say that you can't make money doing that. Of course. Right? You can find an undervalued property above yeah. the NOI, but I mean, look, the two and the 10 year inverted, what, a month or two ago. I mean, there's a recession coming in supposedly in the next six to 12 months or whatever. I think it's more like one to three, mm -hmm. but I'm still going to invest. I'm not using that as an excuse not to do anything, which of I course. think a lot of people do. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to go on to deals with cash flow day one. Yeah, agreed. Definitely. And I think uh, if you do invest in these areas and you do find a good deal, that generally, do you think it requires more work because you're finding them at a deal because there's some a lot of work to be done on the property itself? You're talking like in a primary market? Yeah. I, when, when some, you know, just like use that example, someone brings a New Jersey, New York property. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's like a 1% rent to value ratio. I'm like, dude, there's something, there's something buried yeah. under the ground here. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> still like, and like, it's a newbie too. And like, dude, yeah. yeah, I would just run, man. Yeah, <laughs> there's something. <yeah. laughs> and it's funny you too know? because they're more likely to run from the properties that aren't located in their home state than they are from that one. Yeah, yeah. It's just I see it all the time, right? Like people they want to justify buying somewhere that they're comfortable at. Yeah. And look again, if you're in a private market, it's no bueno. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so, the quicker people realize that, the quicker they can move on and start actually building relationships with people in secondary and tertiary markets. Yeah, and I think that also comes from the idea that a lot of people think that as a landlord, you're always like fixing toilets or, or doing something very much. Uh, you physically have to be at the property, but that's not at all the case. Right. I mean, you you, you pay a property manager. And, exactly. You know, this is speaking to more high pay professionals. Yeah. You know, if it doesn't support that property manager paying them eight to ten percent a month your numbers are not good yeah yeah the oh, property yeah. needs to stand on its own yeah uh you mentioned the rent to value ratio can you explain what that is yeah so the rent to value ratio is um it's a quick and dirty way of like seeing if it will cash flow or you know just comparing it with other properties so what you do is you take the monthly rent and you divide it by the purchase price of the property mm -hmm. so for example um a lot of the properties that i look like to look for for newer people are like a hundred thousand dollar property mm -hmm. um that rent for a thousand dollars a month so a thousand divided by a hundred thousand is one percent yeah so you know if it if it you know rents for 900 then you're at 0. 0.9 and eh, you know probably still you probably still dig a little bit more but like you know place places like in hawaii here a million dollar house will rent for maybe three four thousand bucks yeah. that's like less than half a percent yeah as you not said it's, it's no bueno <laughs> right right not gonna happen not gonna happen not to say that that property has more potential for appreciation yeah but look if you want to invest for appreciation you can knock yourself out but me personally i want to get rich slowly and surely mm -hmm. i invest for cash flow yeah definitely uh so can you kind of go through like a example like another example as to how you use the rent to value ratio um Yes, yeah, so, I mean, just, you know, like a lot of deals that we buy these days are like big syndications. So like this last one was like 300 units. Um, I don't even know how much it costs. I, <laughs> I don't know these things like 14 million or something like yeah. that, something on that scale. But we, look, when you break it down, you know, you just take the, the price per unit. The price per unit on that one was 47. And divided 000. by the rent, right? Right. Oh, and right. once the average rents, the average rents for, you know, high 500s. Like you're well above the one one percent rent to value ratio, mm -hmm. and and now in that project, you know, the, I think the business plan is to bump the rents up by fifty bucks, uh, with a little bit of uh, maybe like three four thousand dollars of rehab, some new paint, some nice um, countertops, and a little bit some appliances and some new yeah. in units, but you know it's simple, yeah, very simple. Um, if the economy kind of goes down, well, at least the property cash flow is day one and you just hold tight. 
Yeah. And you write it out. And what would you tell an attorney or a law student that uh, just doesn't feel comfortable investing in real estate? Because a lot of people I talk to, they just they they admit that the numbers make sense. They admit that it's a good investment, but they just can't take that leap to feel comfortable enough to invest in uh, in real estate as an investment. All right. Well, Tom, cool. You can keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> and we all know it's going to happen in 40 years. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. It's like who wants to get up on the rescue truck and, and get the heck out of here. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not like the nice thing about real estate is like it doesn't take a genius. Yeah. To do it. I think that's what scares people the most, to be honest. Like, I think that so when I talk to people about it, I'll explain the numbers and they think that like there's something I'm not telling them. Right. Like, oh, there's there's some risk I'm not telling them. And then that like it, there really isn't. It's really that simple. It's really you just got to look at the rent to value ratio. Of course, there's other things you could look at and spreads you could look at. Um, but it's not like stocks where there's all this hidden inf- all this hidden information that you're missing or insider trading and such. Actually, right. that's a good part about real estate is that everyone could be an insider trader. Right. I mean, you're using insider information yeah. as a real estate investor. Um, I mean, I think a lot of things is like they don't un- maybe they don't understand like buildings like, well, you get a property inspector to, you know, you pay him 500 bucks and he goes and does a big report for you. Yeah. And then maybe you get some of that fixed right off the bat in the transaction. Yeah. Um, and then like, well, what do I do day to day day to day? Well, I don't know what you do day to day. I don't know how to do an eviction. <laughs> I'm a passive investor. I let the property management do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, what if they screw up? Well, then you fire them. You get another <laughs> one. Luckily, you have some other passive investors you knew, and you just use theirs now. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, a good good thing is like um, Tim Ferriss. I'm sure you know everybody watches him. If you Google his like Tim Ferriss fear setting exercise, mm-hmm. you basically write down all your fears. And then you find ways to mitigate it, like how I just did, right, with all these fears. But at the end of the day, it comes down to people's living beliefs. And that may strike a chord with some people. Like it, it comes down to your ego. You're going to pr- try and protect your ego mm-hmm. unless you're one of those crazy individuals who I like to shake your hand, who likes to get <laughs> uncomfortable and like, you know, just mitigate what they can. And then, hey, let's let's do this and let's learn. Right? Mm-hmm. Let's dance with our fears. Yeah. I got one um, message on Instagram from a viewer and they asked me if I could ask you a question. So if you don't mind, could I uh, shoot a question? Oh yeah, sure. All right. Awesome. So um, one woman contacted me and she has around $50,000 and she wants to buy a home for her to live in, but she also has, has been reading a lot of books about, about real estate as an investment. Do you suggest her buy a home to live in or you suggest her rent an apartment and start investing in real estate? Well, it depends where she lives in, right? Like if she's in a market, a primary market where the rent to value ratios um, on like, you know, the 80% median home price or She's less living than... in New York City. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. So she's just like anybody else in San Francisco, Hawaii, Seattle. And I have this conversation all the time that I, I paid somebody like 500 bucks to write an article for me that I could add stuff to because like, this question comes up. You can check that at com backslash home. But it's like, this is how a lot of millennials, young people get ourselves in trouble, right? Because now you're going to go buy this house, like, you know, average started house in like in Hawaii is $600,000. Yeah. 20% down payment is 120 grand. I could buy you two homes in cash. Right, right. Or <laughs> I use six turnkey houses. Yeah. Leverage properly, right? Yeah. That creates you six times 300, $1,800 passive a month. Yeah. Not even including tax benefits or mortgage appreciation, mm-hmm. mortgage pay down. Um, so right, and but so what happens to that person? Not only do they lose that money that they could invest, but now they're strapped with like that three, four thousand dollar mortgage, and you know that that takes people's cash flow away yeah. in their in their daily budgets, and that cash flow is what I call oxygen. It takes their oxygen away to do anything, yeah. and now they're stuck, and now the kid comes. And now they have to go back to their work. And now they're stuck for the rest of their life because yep. they made this one big mistake. All because this they is... didn't listen to Lane. <laughs> well, they didn't listen to you, right? <laughs> they should have invested. Yeah. Yeah, they really should have. Well, right. I'll uh, I'll pass that on to her as well. Um, right. Is there anything you want to tell my audience? 
don't buy a house to live in if you're living <laughs> in the primary market. Just please don't. It's going to yeah. be the, the worst mistake of your life. Everybody wants you to buy a house because it propels the economy forward. The banks make loans. Yeah. Brokers get paid. But if you want financial freedom, you're going to have to be a little uncomfortable and live in an apartment. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> well, it's better to find out now than find out when you're 60 and you can't retire. Right. 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 But here's here's the good part. Um, you know, it's like the you know the marshmallow psychology tests where uh, they give the marshmallow to the little kids. I don't and they're think like, so. Oh yeah, it's a big it's a big psychology test. It's um so basically they give the marshmallow to the kid and they said, Hey, don't eat this yet. We're gonna come back and if it's still here. Oh we'll yeah, yeah. Do. Right. So it's not in that psychology um uh, I guess study it's very binary right it's mm -hmm. either you'll get one and in a long period of time you'll get a two mm -hmm. right but that's not what this whole like delay gratification is this is not like the whole five dollars you know save your money on a latte it's thing not. yeah yeah if you just, if you just suck it up for a few years especially as a high paid professional buy a couple properties in a couple years you can be financially free probably in like five to seven years. Yeah. Um, I'm going to tell people that they <laughs> they don't believe it at first, you know, because right. that's so foreign. So, so it's not like, you know, you're going to get your marshmallow like in 30 years yeah. if you do it right. Like, no, you just have to suck it up for yeah. like three to five years yeah. and you're going to see the results of this pretty dang quick. Like that apartment, like you can, it's not like you can't have that nice home in New York or Hawaii. You just yep. have to wait a little bit. Live in that crappy apartment for a little bit longer, but then you can live like how other people can dream of. Yeah. And those same people that say that are still putting money into their 401ks and like where they have no idea like what's happening to their cash. Exactly. I mean, this stuff works. I mean, so so today, Chris, like is like my last day at work. So oh. that's why it's a little bit weird. I'm, I'm kind of. Congrats. I don't want to answer your questions about passive investing because I'm <laughs> not doing it full time this afternoon. Yeah. But it works. Yeah. I mean, and now I get to like live like how people dream. Yeah. Still going to do stuff, but of course, <laughs> you know, it, stuff works, right? You just yeah. buy one, one year and you buy another next year. And then maybe in three, four years, you're buying two yeah. and then it just, just steamrolls after a while. Yeah. And even faster too, if you, if you make the right network and get, have the right people in your circle, like one can turn to 14. I mean, for me, my first deal was 14 just because I was so blessed to have people around me that was already, were already investing in real estate. So I didn't have to put in as much legwork as someone trying to learn from scratch. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah. But that's why they have you too, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's where we're like, you know, you resonate with both, right? Like it's all, it's all a message from the same book. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. So where could my audience find more information on what you do and who you are and maybe get on some deals with you? Um, yeah, just check out simplepassivecashflow.com um, and then the Simple Passive Cashflow podcast. Um, and I would say, uh, yeah, if you guys want to shoot me an email, lane at simplepassivecashflow.com. Always looking to connect with other investors and kind of mm -hmm. crowdsource due diligence and you yeah. know, always, you know, like the Birmingham stuff. Actually, I'm selling. I only got three left in Birmingham, but okay. I'm I'm selling them, so I'm soon I'm soon be out of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if they want to know more about your bio, they could always check out this book, right? The one thing that changed everything, uh, and you're on chapter twenty six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, that's a good example, right? Like, you know, if you ever need a property manager in Birmingham, let me know, right? And that's uh, how yeah. you build exactly. You build connections, and like that's how you get over these these um these issues yeah. as a passive investor and you never really have to go there. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, having someone also to just let you know what to expect. My first, my first month or so um, on the one deal I did, uh, didn't produce cash flow the first two months. And I was feeling anxious. I was like, Oh no, I, I wasted the money. What <laughs> happened? No. And then my mentor was like, Hey, calm down. It's totally normal for the first month or two for, for the, there to be an adjustment period, depending on what properties you buy. And I was like, okay, like that 10 minutes of freaking out just automatically ended, you know? So yeah. I, I couldn't imagine doing that by myself and yeah. just sweating for two months straight. <laughs> but that freaking out makes it so much sweeter, right? Later. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, now it's like, I, it's almost as if, um, I get the checks from the, um, from the deals and it barely even, I'm so used to it now. 
that like it's slowly wearing away, which makes me want to find more deals to get that high that you get when you know when you close right. on properties. Yo, junkie. Yeah, Yo, yeah. Junkie. <laughs> but yeah, Lane, thank you, uh, and I hope to have you on again. Uh, it was a, a definitely was a pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. See you later. Bye. Morning, What's up, guys? I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you liked it, leave it five stars and a written review on Apple Podcasts. You can also access this podcast through SoundCloud, Google Play Podcasts, and my website, dmghpodcast.com. As always, it's Chris from DMGH Podcast. Broken glass, the weight of rain and even skies, choices we make. Drifting from everything real, every day just seems the 